as I live and breathe, Bob Henley live here with me today. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Well, Bob, you are a labor uh, reporter. And uh, as such, you have chosen a profession that marginalizes you to the edge of uh, <laughs> the edge of the media landscape. Um, you and I were talking before this interview and you brought, I said, we're going to be covering the airport thing. You brought up like the, several, several right. stories uh, that people really have not heard of. So why don't you just, why don't you just hit me with, sure, uh, with sure. what you I had, had the pleasure and honor of being down in Washington, D.C. at the American Federation of Government Employees Union, which represents around 700,000 federal employees that work from everywhere from the EPA to the Veterans Administration, TSA, Bureau of Prisons, that's a big chunk of the two million people that work for the federal government. And they had not had an in-person meeting, of course, since the pandemic started. And so uh, I would have to say there was a wonderful reporter, uh, Mr. Davidson from the Washington Post, uh, two folks from a fairly obscure uh, uh, radio outlet, and then I think one other internet person and myself uh, that I could see that were covering it. Now, at this event, what we learned from Dr. Everett Kelly, who's president of the AFGE, is that they estimate at least 600 uh, federal civil service workers died of COVID, mm. um, uh, with many of them succumbing to occupational exposure, that that number is just a baseline, that um, there are any number that are dealing with long-term haul COVID issues, and that the uh, federal government and the bureaucracies, particularly during the Trump administration, really fought disclosure of this. And it's very important to understand that in real time, what we had here was the Trump administration, when TSA officers uh, died, and the first ones were in California, when the, the a flight came from actually from England to uh, California, to Northern California, they fell ill. And from the very beginning, the Trump administration resisted disclosure, made it hard to get the basic PPE in place, and did not let the union advance contact tracing. Mm. That action was repeated throughout the federal civil service. And in the process, the Trump administration added significantly to the body count and helped spread the infectious disease that's had this country on its knees for quite a while now. Mm. And we saw this most graphically with what happened with the meat processing facilities with Rachel Maddow did a good job in some local papers in the Midwest. In that case, the president who was reluctant to use the War Prior Act to create PPE, which we were, which was rationed, instead he used it as a way to give the meat uh, processors a kind of immunity and made it possible for them to actually act in a contrary advice of the local health officials. And as a result, hundreds of meat processing workers died, and among them were USDA food inspectors. Wait, this so I feel like we have heard. Paired. Oh, tell me. Yes. No, I'm finished like we, for now. I feel, I feel like we, oh, you're finished. <coughs> Excuse me. I feel like we did hear about what happened in the meat packing um, because of Rachel and right. others who were covering it and, and how important unions were. They had a moment in the, in the, in the sun. Uh, during COVID because they were organizing against these terrible pra labor practices. But you're saying that these numbers have never been published. The right, no, and as a matter remember. of fact, today, the United States has no registry or count of how many of the uh, close to 1 million Americans died as a consequence of their service as essential workers. Mm -hmm. And so what we have here is a country and the economy, thanks to large corporations, marching on oblivious to the fact that the government and corporations let down the uh, American worker in a dramatic fashion with deadly consequences. Um, and the reason why it's important to track this is if we do not get a sense of where people were exposed, it's impossible to prepare for either another deadly variant or another pandemic, which experts tell us is not a matter of if, but when. Oh, no, they don't care. <laughs> I mean, exactly. uh, where I live, they're like, eh, they don't need masks in school, even though cases are going up. The people don't want the mask and we're not going to do contact tracing and it's all over. If you get right. it it's on you. <laughs> yeah. 
So I would say the other thing here is that uh, what we have is a situation where you have also, we know 50% of the people that had an exposure to COVID uh, and had an infection will have some kind of lingering consequence of varying severity, some yeah. not severe. But we're already seeing instances where those heroes that we bang pots for are finding themselves disabled and need worker compensation. And depending on the state where they're in and their employer, in some cases, the employers that ordered them to work and had them work forced overtime are now fighting their workers' comp claim. Because in the United States, there are 50 different uh, state approaches. As now, federal workers have a presumption. But for instance, in the New York region, New Jersey has a worker presumption. So if you are a nurse, you have a better shot at getting it. Although here, also, one of the, this New Jersey was one of the deadliest places on the earth in terms of the per capita death rate. We have cases where hospitals are actually fighting the claim. So we say that we're concerned about healthcare workers, but actually the government is not does not have their back. We know, for instance, the only comprehensive survey that was done was an important uh, investigative project by the Guardian newspaper and Kaiser Health News, which tracked in the first year of the pandemic, some 3,600 healthcare workers that died of an occupational exposure to COVID. And most of them, surprise, surprise, were people of color. Um, Bob, are the unions in their various areas, you mentioned healthcare workers, we've also got teachers, we've got transit workers, et cetera. Uh, are, the, are the unions trying to work toward helping their members get um, workers' comp? Well, yeah, the ones, the what, most importantly, they are. Yeah, they are. And often unions will have lawyers that are familiar with this work. But uh, one of the things that the unions have tried to do is to track anecdotally the death toll. So like different unions have done a better job. CWA has done a pretty good job. And if you go to the website, you'll see an memoriam, a memoriam uh, list. But um, there was a very big win, the AFL-CIO um, just had a big win in the last budget authorization, which was another underreported story where the CDC has to, within six months, come up with a comprehensive occupational analysis of which people and which jobs uh, succumb to COVID and which industries and at what and what different kinds of settings did that happen in. That's essential because what we're going to have here is uh, people that are familiar with 9-11 World Trade Center crisis know that... Um, in 9-11, in we had the EPA saying the air was safe to breathe. They wanted to open up Wall Street. Uh, we now uh, know the air was very toxic and that more people have died from the occupational exposure from working down there than actually died the day of the attack. Some eighty to 90,000 people are part of the World Trade Center health program. And we still don't fully understand the impacts of that. This is a very similar situation. Uh, long COVID is still not fully understood. It's not mapped by any degree. And so we're seeing symptoms that range from lingering cardiovascular issues, brain fog, respiratory complications. And so it's very important if we want to support the healthcare workforce that we have a worker comp system that matches the challenge because many of these people can get back to work and we know we're going to need healthcare workers. I, I have brain fog and I didn't have COVID as far as I know. <laughs> I just think the pandemic gave us all brain fog in general. It's right. very catchy, even if you don't catch the Rona. Um, not to make light here, but what other stories do you think if, first, what stories do you think it would be awesome to see covered on the mainstream media? And what effects do you think they would have if labor started to really become part of the fabric of even MSNBC, which you know, is supposed to be on the left. Well, I think that part of the problem is that the hottest uh, uh, front right now for one of the hottest funds for labor organizing is the media itself. It's very important to understand that uh, over the last few years, the consolidation of outfits like Gannett, which owns one in five local papers, the corporate model is to buy your local newspaper, uh, to strip it of its assets, to lay off the reporters, and then aggregate content. So one reporter writes a story that appears across the country, they get paid uh, poor wages. So, I mean, it's important to understand to get our arms around what's happened in this industry. When I was working my first after equity contract as a radio reporter in 1999 and 2000, 
was $48,000 a year. I just wrapped up an assignment with the chief leader where I was getting $45,000 like two generations later. Yeah. So when I was at the Village Voice, I received a dollar a word and we were represented by the United Auto Workers. Today, when you write, generally it's like 10 cents a word. Your stories are aggregated and you see no participation for it after you've gotten your 150 or $200 fee. So what's happened is we have a collapse of authenticated news. What we have is some very large media organizations which program to uh, the biases of the people they're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. It's not independent news gathering. Yes, we have some giants out there, uh, like the New York Times, like the Washington Post. But as far as local news, like the kind of important news that we saw broke by those brave papers out in the Midwest about what was happening in meatpacking plants, for the most part, local media, news media, that is where people ask the critical question, how do you know what you know, <laughs> has been eviscerated. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, if you just if if anyone's watching, just put in the comments. How do you get your local news? I mean, I know a lot of people who still have cable watch local news at five o'clock. I mean, you have to like be at home at five to watch. <laughs> it's just insane. I mean, people, you know. So put in the comments. Where do you get local news? Do you know what's going on with your local government, your school board? Uh, do you know what's going on? Uh, you know, with the COVID number. Do you know what's going on literally in your local town? And by local, even if you're in New York City watching, put like Brooklyn. You know, do you know like what's happening in Cobble Hill, your neighborhood? Where do you get this information? It's it's crazy. You're right. Well, I'll give you I'll give you one example of where uh, to some there's a, a major story that I, I did a lot with, but I think it's underreported. Right now, as we speak, there are five million households in the United States, primarily composed of single parents, who have not collected the expanded child tax credit that was approved last year. That is to say this $14 billion sitting in the U.S. Treasury now that struggling moms and dads have not accessed. That means like $3,600. Why is that? Why? Well, because what happens is uh, the debate in Washington is at 10,000 feet. They'll debate over extending the child tax care credit. But quite frankly, they don't really care if anybody actually applies for it. They want the talking point. Mm. And the work of finding out why people aren't getting this is basically uh, digging deep and basic community all uh, organizing. One of the things that when you speak with people that are doing nonprofit tax preparation, that's a very important thing right now. People should know that the United Way uh, has uh, online, they have a project called Alice, and it's called, it follows people that are struggling, parents, uh, in terms of they, they're not living below the poverty line. These are people that have to choose each month to rotate out the car payment or child care mm -hmm. and then have a nice tap dance for the person looking for the money. Yeah. And much of the United States, that's as much as 35 to 40 percent of the population. In fact, if you add the people struggling below poverty and the people in this Alice category in many places, that's the majority of the people in that town, city or county. And so the reality is those folks aren't have, are too busy to engage in politics. A lot of times, for instance, they don't have direct deposit. A lot of times they are so traumatized by what it takes to work the three jobs cleaning hotel rooms to survive mm -hmm. that they just can't figure out how to get a direct deposit from, um, uh, from the IRS. Moreover, they may not even have a bank. They may be... So we working people have been at such a disadvantage for so long and the ruling class has been so disinterested in their people's actual circumstance that we have this deterioration. I think it's instructive to notice. When is it going to hit the working class? I'm sorry to cut you off. When is it going to hit the working class? Uh, the, when is it going to hit the ruling class? Like, you know, it, we're all one. And eventually when the working class is destroyed and the middle class who have lawyers or who have, you know, the middle class starts getting more mad because they're starting to become, you know, lower down on the food chain. When when does it actually hit those people that they actually needed us in the first place to run their companies? Well, it's happening now in the form of the Great Resignation. And so one of the things that I think since September, we know close to 20 million Americans have left their job. That's visible from space. I mean, 
That is eight million people, seven and a half million more people. Maybe that's why Elon Musk went up there to right. see the, where the hell the people went who all they, they are that's bigger <laughs> than the American labor movement in the FL sale by about seven million. And when well, where do these people go, Bob? Well, they, they're finding other arrangements. Uh, they're reprioritizing their life. We have seen a um people are tearing up the social contract about work, and it's really upsetting Wall Street. It's really not worth it to work for eight dollars an hour. Precisely. That is you might as well just move back in with your sister and you can <laughs> you know what I mean? You can well, both share some. The sort reality of is that during the pandemic, in a in a scale that has not been seen in modern memory, the government and private employers let down the working class catastrophically and people died in large numbers. And so I found out, for instance, down at the AFG conference that there was a plan that was passed during the Trump administration to actually look at the VA at a hospital hospital system and perhaps downsize it. And that plan is still going forward. Mm. So in the middle of a mass death event where we don't even have the full um, uh, excess mortality numbers, we're contemplating downsizing one of the most critical parts of America's healthcare system. Mm. Uh, there, we are not looking at the fact, for instance, that the healthcare um, system in places in rural areas and urban areas was already in a steep decline when the pandemic hit. We had already seen life expectancy decline three years in a row before the pandemic. Indeed, I will tell you, it's America's sick healthcare system. It's for profit healthcare system that was a deadly precondition for the pandemic. Absolutely. Bob, uh, at the beginning of this show, uh, we covered the action that happened at the 20 airports across the country, yeah. the airport and, and also at the headquarters of the major airlines. We covered the airport workers and the SEIU action. There, I'd love to get your comments on that particular issue that's going sure. on and your thoughts about their movement. Well, I would say that we have seen um, SEIU really take a leadership here in terms of organizing a broad working class and also uh, really been innovative with reaching out to the undocumented community. One of the things that has been a problem historically in the labor movement is that this uh, it's used against people if they don't have uh, legal paperwork. And the way our economy works is that because they are undocumented, unscrupulous employers use that against them. Mm. It's instructive to keep in mind that we have just, uh, we finished the anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, March 25th, 1911. Imagine before that that fire resulted in 146 multi, mostly young immigrant women dying. Before that happened, two years before that, over 20,000 Young, primarily young immigrant women went on a general strike and shut down that entire industry and got major gains as a consequence. We don't hear about that story unless you follow labor. It's not generally taught in high school. And so we're at that kind of moment now where collective action like you're seeing at the airport, particularly when what we're talking about, every place is potentially in a pandemic is a triangle uh, shirt fire. It, during a pandemic, we had these frontline essential workers bore the heaviest price that we took for granted. And so it makes sense now that after coming out of the traumatic events that they organized, because the places that were organized were better protected. The places where there were unions, they got PPE. The places where they weren't, they didn't. This is fascinating, Bob. You're giving me an idea of, uh, you know, I have a little one and I've been following. She's learning to read. We're going to the library. And you do see that there's, um, at, at least if you live in a place where the librarian herself has agency to choose which books to put in the library, right. where, like I do, luckily, even though we're in a kind of a red zone here, um, <clears throat> you see the librarian reads and she knows accurate history. So she yes. somehow has an, uh, she desires to push that forward. But they have a lot of children's books that are, um, you know, uh, detailing even you know some of the some of the labor leaders some of the female labor leaders right. that kind of thing which is very interesting i i don't remember that from when i was a kid but i'm wondering if there's a space for writing 
uh, a textbook, not not inserting labor history into someone else's textbook because you'll never get through Texas. That's where they right. That's where they make all these textbooks. Um, they're still trying to get evolution in those textbooks, but you know, a textbook uh, for young people as they start to understand. Um, we could have critical labor. Uh, theory starting to teach in kindergarten and we could make an uproar uh, across the country. What do you think, Bob? I would say the idea of teaching collective action is essential. And that's the thing that um, I would say it gets in the way of people being able to um, actualize. And so in an environment where people don't feel like they have power, they're left individually and it's much easier for management to exploit their fears and anxiety in a predator economy. And that's where we're in. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much, Bob Henley, author of this book, this book right over here. Uh, no, don't make it big. No, no, we can see it. <laughs> At Stuck Nation. That's my Twitter handle too. I also have this book. It's that book <laughs> and this book right here. Look, I got a signed. No, it's not signed, Bob. Can you please put your pen through the computer? I will, I promise. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being on thank the program. You. I appreciate it Take so care. much. Bye. You can follow Bob's work at salon.com and he is at laborpress.org and he is on the Twitters at Stuck Nation. We tweeted out this from Act TV. So uh, with his tags, so you can just go there and click, 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 follow, et cetera. And, you know, maybe share the show because as you've heard, no one's covering labor. All right. And labor is obviously one of the most important uh, things that could stop the, the flow of democracy. We or excuse me, the, the decline of democracy. I, I see we only have a few minutes left. I wanted to play you uh, a video of Chris Hedges uh, where he talks about that labor is the thing. Organized labor, the joining of organized labor movements, making new unions if you need to, like the Amazon union. <clears throat> that that is really the lever of power we need to push if we want to um, strengthen our very, very weak democracy. Put your comments in the box. Thank you so much. We are on once a week right now, just for right now. Not sure how long that's going to last, but we are on Thursdays at one o'clock. So if you notice that we started early today, you were right. Again, reset your calendars. This is not just a function of the uh, Eastern time zone being changed to fall back, spring forward, et cetera. This is our new time. One Eastern, or you can watch the reruns on Act TV's YouTube page. You can follow me over at Twitter for non-Act TV uh, fun things, Juliana Forlano, or I'm on YouTube at Juliana Forlano Live, where I sometimes go Juliana Forlano Live uh, if you would like me to talk about uh, more cultural things uh, and and uh, other things other things. That's what I do over there. Thanks so much for watching. We appreciate you so much and we will see you next time.